ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Guido. He'll be talking, he's presenting our last presentation today before dinner, and he will be talking about security more. Uh, yes, so hello, thank you for coming. Yeah, a short warning, as you can see, this presentation may be low level. If you are, um, if you don't like low level, I still encourage you to stay. You might learn something and you might actually like it. So, um, okay, a few words about me. I'm the captain of Dragon Sector, what is Dragon Sector in a moment. I'm also the author of a book uh, in Polish, Zrozumieć Programowanie, it's going to be in English next year. It's about Java programming. Anyway. All opinions are, uh, that I express during this talk are not my barber's opinions, are not my accountant's opinions, are my opinions. Mm, thank you for remembering that. Uh, this note is there because I actually, during the daytime work for Google, as a security engineer slash senior software engineer. So yeah, that's what our lawyers make us say. Anyway, so Dragon Sector uh, is a capture the flag team, a security capture the flag team. Basically, a security capture the flag is a tournament during which you have to solve several tasks related to security, ranging from 20 to 50. They are sometimes easy and sometimes they are stupid hard. And, um, well, when you play capture the flags, you sometimes encounter also Python related challenges. So, a couple of them are going to actually be shown during this presentation. Mm. Cool. So, what's on the menu? On the menu today is a, a mix, actually a mix of random stuff which uh, relates from one side to security and from the other side somehow to Python. And um, I tried to balance programming with security attacks on Python. I'm not sure that actually worked. But I think, I think uh, the final mix is pretty okay. So let's start with the first thing. This is actually one of the tournament challenges. Um, it was during a Russian-made uh, Capture the Flag tournament called Sochi CTF. It was, basically what you got was a tab file. So it was a file with a tab extension. After analyzing it, it turned out to be a ZX spectrum image of a tape like a magnetic tape, and after analyzing it further, it turned out that it's a small basic loader which executed um, ZX Spectrum assembly written binary, which was a simple crack me. So you had to enter a password, and once you entered the password, there was a QR-like code thingy. Well, it's not really QR code, of course, but it's some bits encoded, and Whatever password you put in there, an image for it was generated. And the idea was that, well, what we thought, and you're actually right, but if you enter the right password, then the image will actually form readable text. So, it will, was probably trying to decrypt something. Now, the keyword here is the meaningful picture, so you don't need to find the password. You need to find the meaningful, meaningful picture. This is important because I actually didn't care about the password at all. Now, long story short, uh, this isn't a reverse engineering conference, I'm going to skip this. Um, after, I don't know, five or ten hours of reverse engineering Z80 um, bytecode using IDA and ZX Spin, which is an emulator which has a pretty decent debugger, uh, I found out that um, something like this is going on. There is a function on the address uh, 6081, that's an address in the ZX Spectrum memory, right? And this function is called with a 16-bit number. Now, this 16-bit number is actually a hash of a password you entered. And this number is used as basically the key to the decryption. And at the address of um, 8785 in the memory, there is this bitmap which gets rendered, right? Now, uh, since I already knew where it is, I could display it using some script, the script does something in Python. 
And well, this is not what I got. It's uh, the same image if you, if you compare them, but just this Python by console using axes instead of nice graphics, if you call that pixelation nice graphics, of course. So the idea for the attack was like this. Um, since there are only, this is only a 16-bit number, that means the key has to be among the 65,000 values that fit into a 16-bit number, right? So let's just generate this image for all the numbers. Now, I didn't want to sit all day, probably all year, and type every number and wait for it to render, right? You didn't want that. But you wanted to, you wanted to automatize it somehow. And ideally, you put all the generated images inside this old TXT file. How to do that? Well, what I did, I grabbed the P, uh, PYZX80. It's a, not full, but it's a partial implementation of Z80 CPU in Python. And uh, it's actually pretty easy to use it. It's, it's just the CPU, there are no peripherals, just, just only the CPU. So what you had to do is you had to create like a minimal class which pretended to be one memory, which was just an array basically. Load the memory dump of the, um, of spectrum of the well, when, so you, when spectrum was running the application, you just dump the memory and loaded it into the RAM. And next you started to set up the CPU. Setting up the CPU basically boiled down to just transcribing from the debugger all the registry values to, uh, to make the environment identical. We already knew the memory would be identical, obviously. And then, basically, this is a for loop, right? So, for each hash, we run in a loop the execution of this image rendering, of this decompression, oh, sorry, decryption. After that, and uh, after that, I mean after five hours, because it took some time. It was simulation after all, and Python, I actually used PyPy to make it faster, and, but it still took a couple of hours. I get a 150 megabyte file, which, uh, which contains the flag. Now, I actually have this flag somewhere here. Oh, is this? How do you find a flag in, in a file which has like 150 megabytes? Now, it's actually super easy. If this is supposed to be like readable text, it's going to have a lot of blank space, right? So you just look for 20 spaces. I actually did that already, just to, you know, to test. And you somewhere there find, congratulations, the key is, and the flag. Yeah, so this was, I was actually pretty happy about the instrumentation for the static spectrum was in Python and not some parallel or anything, which is, you know, write only and never read. Okay, so let's go to the next charge. Uh, this one is, uh, it didn't involve any programming in Python, but it did involve Python. Now, what you got was a hello.tar file. Now, hello.tar after untaring, it was quite a lot of um, dynamic libraries for Linux, library.zip file, and also a hello executable. If you run it, well, you had to pass the argument, uh, and the, in the argument you had to pass the password, and it told you, hey, this is correct or this is not correct. Obviously, we didn't know the password, so it said, ah, no, which we didn't like. Now, it turned out it's a compiled Python. Well, what they did, they actually bundled the Python interpreter and uh, gave a PYC file, right? Only PYC without the source code. Now, what do you do when you get a PYC file? Well, you download the disassembler, dis actually the compiler for Python, right? And you run it and you get, uh, well, the bytecode. Yeah, sorry, the bytecode, the source code. Now, uh, that didn't really work. After looking what's there and trying to both disassemble and decompile it, it didn't work. The decompiler didn't work, Python disassembler didn't work, you know, the disk module, which is in the default installation, and it outputted some invalid opcodes. Now, um, yeah, this is an attempt to decompile which gave a similar result. What they did, they actually modified the interpreter and changed the number of the opcodes. So no existing tool would work. So that's actually not bad. Um, Turned out that it's uh, not going to be a guessing game. For example, the imports, 
there, there was some we can the end of the function, which is important. Because end of the function and there was import star opcode, right? Now, what do you expect at the end of the function? What well, are turn opcode, right? So if you look up in the Python source code, you, you will see that one has uh, one opcode has the value of 84 and the other has 83. So what they did, they swapped a couple of numbers which are really close together, which was easy to guess. In the end, um, I basically using the disassembler tried to guess in the random places what the opcode should be and change them using a hex editor. So after modifying the PYC file, I could take the uh, yeah, these are basically what they, the swappings we did. There were a couple of more of them, but uh, it, it wasn't much. After that, we could actually disassemble it. I didn't go for the decompiler, I, I went for the disassembler, because I expected some of those would be still bad, and I would still have to fix them during reverse engineering. Uh, this was one function called encrypt string. It actually was a loop which called another function called uh, rot or rotate char. Now, this function is super short, right? As you can see, it's only uh, 15 maybe opcodes, so it's just reverse engineering on the fly. Uh, there are two load globals which basically do nothing and we don't care about them. Then there's load fast which pushes, in this case, the C argument, uh, C is the argument of a function, to the stack of a Python stack machine. Um, then there is, it calls function 1. Well, function 1, as you can see, a line above is actually the ORD function. So we can write that, but it was actually equal to ORD. Next, we load a constant value of 33, put it on the stack, obviously, because it's a stack machine in the end. Then we um, do subtraction. We get this. After that, we load amount. We do addition. We load another constant. We do uh, module, module operation. And then we load another constant, we do addition, and then we call the last function and do return. So, pretty short, pretty easy to reverse engineer even if you just can read English and cannot read Python bytecode. The final code looked like this. Um, actually, the bottom part is the encrypt string function reverse engineer and reverse, because uh, the function was encrypting the string and we needed to decrypt it. And the only change I think is the minus sign next to the or in the for loop. Yeah, after running it, you get the modified interpreters are evil, which was the flag which you submitted to get the points. Cool, so uh, let's move to the next problem. How many of you know what is the buffer overflow? Perfect. How many of you know what is return oriented programming? Okay, cool. Perfect. Uh, you can leave because the next segment is going to be talking about return-oriented programming. So just to be sure we are on the same page, what is the buffer overflow? We have a stack and think about like C or actually assembly level stack, right? You have return address saved there. If you call a function, the return address gets saved on the stack. And you have a buffer and something writes to the buffer and that thing overflows the buffer and overwrites the return address. Basically, the bread and butter of security, right? Um, now, in the old times, the attacker would overwrite the, um, the return address with the address of the buffer itself, and in the buffer, he would put machine code to get executed. So when the function returns, it actually returns to the stack and starts executing attacker-provided machine code, which, for example, dials back to his home and gives him a shell on your server. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's how it was done in the old times. Now it's a little harder. Because something called no execution bit was added to Intel CPUs and AMD CPUs, it actually allows you to tell that this part of memory, for example the stack, is not executable. You cannot execute any machine code out of it. Which is great, because that means when an attacker tries to return to the shell code, then it crashes. If there is an interrupt phone, and yeah, the application is good, which is good. Now, here is where return oriented programming comes into. Mainly what you do today is you override, you don't put your machine code anywhere. You actually don't have machine code in most exploits at all. What you do have, you have a couple of more return addresses. The idea is that the first return address returns to some code which is already in memory. And at the end of that code, there is a return instruction which triggers getting the next return address from the stack and returning to, well, jumping to that piece of code, which is also ended with the return 
uh, return an instruction. In the end, um, it's basically a chain of returns, and um, between the returns there are meaningful instructions which are supposed to do something. For example, uh, what do we return to? Usually when you have the application or the libraries, let's assume this is their code, the machine code, you look for gadgets and gadgets are in random places, and you return to them. A gadget may look like this. Sorry. Mm. Please assume that this is a larger piece of code, and you just jump at the end of a function. And there is just pop rcx and red, which means uh, because you control the stack as the attacker, set my set, sorry, set the RCX register to a value on the stack, and then go to the next gadget. And having a couple of such gadgets, or actually multiple such gadgets, allows you to execute any code you, you like. And you don't execute your machine code, you execute machine code which is already in memory. Now, how do you find the gadgets? Well, you use Python, for example. Uh, personally, I use uh, there is a distorm free, it's a disassembly in, in time for which has bindings for Python as well. And uh, how to find gadgets? Well, after setting up some stuff which I didn't bother to do automatically, but it actually should be doable, which is legal. Um, there is a simple function which gets a small buffer of bytes and it disassembles them. So it translates the machine code into human readable text form. Um, and it actually looks for the return instruction. When it gets to the return instruction, it breaks. And it returns a list of the text human readable form, uh, aka mnemonics. Now, um, the main of this script, which is uh, super badly written as uh, the whole script, does this. Uh, for each sequence of bytes, just disassemble it and uh, find all the unique lists of instructions basically, and put them in the file. Now the file is like 5 megabytes usually, and there are quite a lot of gadgets, you can see some examples on the right. Uh, usually you, you basically look for stuff like this, which is simple, easy, just some pops, some reds, maybe one hour instruction, you don't care about anything else because this is actually enough, usually. Um, if you're lucky, the file is 5, megabyte, 5 megabytes, it's quite easy to look through it, but when you're unlucky, the file is like 200 lines and you have no options. You have five gadgets which just don't work. Now, how do you create a... You need to finalize the exploit. How do you create a payload out of these packs where you use Python? Now, uh, the way I do it um, is you just create a function called DQ, which stands for data cure if you programmed an assembly, you know that. Then, out of that, uh, it just gets a number and it creates an eight and calls it as an 8 byte value. Now, uh, out of this, you create small blocks. Each small block describes exactly one gadget. In this example, I created a function called setRDI, which basically fills a small text buffer with the address of the gadget and the value it's supposed to set. So you don't have to like think about gadgets, you just think, oh, I need to call this function, which will set my register. Now, out of these functions, you create larger functions. For example, read, which is calls the read function from the kernel with the arguments you gave it, which is the file descriptor, the buffer, which is the address of memory, of course, and the count how many bytes do you want to read there. So, having that, you actually, well, get more of these, and in the end you put a quite a large program which has several gadgets, which do what you like. In this case, it changes the privileges on some memory, so it's both writable and executable, and readable, of course, and reads your data from what you sent to the application, it's a network application, it puts it in that exact location, so you can just jump it and run your machine code. Now, um, so this is basically how it looks like. Uh, this is an example of how it looks like uh, the code, I would say. That's the sequence of numbers. Now, in the end, you put it somewhere in the exploit. This is the whole exploit. And, uh, well, you just send it to the application, among other stuff, and hope that it works. Now, actually, I found Python to be the best language for it. I tested this in a couple of other languages, like, for example, C, and it's a, it's a pain. Python seems to be the best just to do these small string operations. Now, uh, there's another thing which adds to this, which I'm going to show later. 
it's the term method. It's a default library in Python, which actually um, gets a socket and create, gives you an interactive terminal. Whatever you type is sent through the socket, and uh, whatever that is sent through the socket to you gets shown on the screen, which is perfect if you actually spun a shell on some server and need to interact with it, and you don't want to do it automatically. Okay, at the end of this part, there's actually an example for you. So, this is, uh, who knows what pickle is? Well, as expected. Um, okay, so this is actually a true story, though an unmixed. Let's assume there is a company, a web service, which uses pickle to unpickle unsafe data, unsafe meaning attacker control. In this case, uh, the data is in cookies. So you enter a page and the cookie is set. Now, there are a couple of ways to store sessions. As you know, you can store a session by just giving the user a session ID and he sends you the session ID. Uh, the other way is to store the state on the, um, on the browser, basically, of the user. This is a little faster if you have a super large service with thousands of servers because you don't have to query the database for each session, you just get all the data. Now the problem is when the data is unsigned and unencrypted, as is in this case. So you have the state, and the state cookie looks like this, and as you can see it's basically like a concatenation of some uh, names and, uh, yeah, and what, what's, that, what's the strings you see here? Perfect, base 64. Uh, which is an encoding, is not encryption, of course. So, after looking into it, uh, for example, using Python, did I say Python? Python's awesome, actually, yes. Now, um, you get this. Now, this string is actually like pure data for pickle. So, pickle looks like this. This means this data has been pickled and you need to unpickle it to read it, which we can do. Uh, for example, like this. And you get, uh, this is already a Python dictionary. Now, as you know, probably if you read the documentation for Pickle, there is this huge red warning, do not use Pickle. <laughs> now, why do you not, why shouldn't you use Pickle? Uh, let's, let's go through object serializations for a second. JSON doesn't support object serialization and the serialization. It just supports plain old data. Perfect. Uh, from a security perspective, I'm not sure if the programmers look at it the same way. Now, PHP, uh, it's a little worse. It has something called serialized and unserialized, and they actually support creating an array which is then cast into an object. It's pretended that this array is actually like the fields of some object. Which is really good. A method called wakeup is called on it, but the method is of course programmer provided, and then the destructor is called at the end because, well, it's an object. Now the problem is that in some cases you can actually use a technique similar to return-oriented programming to abuse it and run, use the code which is already there for bad purposes, but, uh, well, let's go to Python. What Pickle does is Pickle actually allows the attacker to select a constructor from a given module, from any module actually, and to tell what parameters should this constructor be called with. Uh, for example, we can call subprocess the open, which basically creates a new process. Now, um, I actually wanted to include my own version how to do it, but I found this guy's website, and it's actually pretty awesome what he does here, so let's just use this. Now, uh, what, what's happening here is there's a method called reduce, which when an object is pickled, this method is being called, and it's supposed to tell Python what do you need to do to unpickle this object later on. And thanks to it, it can, we can create a new class which, when it gets unpickled, calls popen with uh, sh obviously, with uh, standard input, output, and error redirected to fd. fd in this case is 20. Now, why is it 20? It's, it's not supposed to be 20, we're going to change it. Uh, I'll tell you in a second. Anyway, the final string looks like as well, base 64, right? Now, um, why 20 in this case or anything else? Mainly, when you connect to a HTTP server, right, a socket is allocated on the system just for your connection. Now, uh, if you can create a new process and all the standard inputs and outputs are redirected to the exact same socket number, because they are identified by numbers, then you get interactive shell. And uh, this is why, why I like this, what he does here, because he automatizes what I would 
actually do the manually. Okay, so a better version, a better version of a cookie would look like this. Now, uh, actually, I have a demo for this. So, I have this large file with a lot of uh, low quality code, which serves as my base for this kind of coding. And as you can see, I basically connect. Uh, you probably cannot see a microphone figure, sorry about that. Okay, is it any better? Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah. So what I do, I connect to the web server, and then <coughs> I send a super small HTTP request with the cookie set to whatever the cookie is the first cookie we server, so it doesn't do anything evil yet. Um, okay. Yeah, so when I run it, um, basically it does nothing. It just signs and exits, right? So, but that's the, the desired state. Now, I can uncomment the telnet thing here to get a more interactive shell, which isn't going to be really interactive yet. Um, okay, wait. Oh yeah, it works. Basically, the server has some processing to do and the reply comes after five seconds. That's the story. And we have some HTML code there, so it seems it works. Now, let's copy the part of the presentation. Mm. Okay, I'm going to copy this part because I actually do need to change the FD to something else. So I'm going to copy the whole class. Okay, now we need to set the FD to something that will probably be okay. Um, it's quite easy. If there, is, uh, if there is a lot of traffic to the server, it's not easy this time. It will be easy because there is no traffic. So it's like this. You have standard input, output, and output of errors, right? So that's three. And the sockets are always allocated from zero. So that's zero, one, two. Now, there is a listening socket which listens for connections, which is uh, three. So the incoming connection will probably be four. So we do this. Uh, now this actually I need to copy some rules. Okay, that's it. And now we're going to run it again. Uh, no, we're not going to run it because it doesn't like me not declaring the chart or something. And I need to remove this nice error. Okay. <laughs> I'm too slow with the mic, sorry. So we basically get a free show on this by not using the cookie decoding mechanism. Anyway, just to... Um, if you really need to use pickle, you can actually do two things in that scenario, right? You either sign, cryptographically sign this cookie, so it cannot be changed because you detect changes, or you actually modify the pickle class to uh, so that it doesn't allow you to deserialize objects, which is quite easy. Cool. So, uh, let's go back to the next topic, which is uh, scripting things with Python. Actually, GDB, can, you know, with the bug, it has a wonderful API. No, it doesn't. Actually, it's like one of the most worst APIs I saw, except that it's documented. The documentation is really cool, so you can actually make heads of it and tails of it. And and yeah, and write code like that. You can, you know, create a set of your, your functions which, which works well with it. Actually, IDA API for Python is both this bad and it's not documented at all, so... Yeah, so it isn't bad. Anyway, it helped me a couple of times, for example, there was uh, OCaml crack me. OCaml was compiled into Linux binary and you had to reverse engineer it. Now the problem was that OCaml stores all the strings as well, lists, and I mean linked lists. So, uh, I must say that 
Well, I found came really handy here to script GDP server actually because strings would look more readable like this than, than just reading the first letter and having to type five lines of code in GDP by hand to jump to the next letter. Uh, I just tried to script, well, GDP to mode with Python. I got some user interface running. This is actually running in Chrome, so this is also a dumb Ruby I work server. Um, but of course, I needed to do some other things later on, I never finished it. I probably open source it sometime in the future. Now, uh, Python is actually used in other places. I mentioned I already. Win, uh, Winpack, which is the Windows kernel debugger, is also scriptable with Python, but at least an extension. And uh, in indeed, the debugger also is scriptable. Now, I used it at least once in IDA. There was a funny task which could well, you know that there are 64-bit processes and 32-bit processes, right? Now, they can, you can mix code of 32 and 64-bit in one binary. And like, actually, there was a function which was sometimes called as 32-bit code and sometimes as 64-bit code, which got really annoying to analyze it. But uh, using Python, you could just disassemble it in both ways before the other way was put in the comments. Okay, and one of the last examples. Um, so there is this thing in Python, it's called sandboxing. You basically know what eval is, right? You evaluate the code which comes. And you can actually in Python specify that, hey, the code which comes from an external user, I actually want him to only access some functions, not all functions, only part of the environment. And you can specify it. Now, uh, let's assume we have a, uh, uh, this is actually also based on a true story. Let's assume that we have a web server with this calculator shown here. Now, you send a formula and it gives you the result, right? 6 times 9 is 42. Now, if you send something like this, like 0 slash 0, because if you're an attacker, the first thing you do is you send funny stuff and you see how it behaves. In this case, it behaves by sending an error, zero division error, which immediately tells you this is Python, right? Now, let's play a little more with the formula. What will happen when we will send this formula? Uh, a, it will say that it's a name error. B, it's a type error. And C, it will get detected telling you like, man, FBI is already after you just run. Um, why a name error and why a type error? So a name error would be when open function is not found because it's not in the environment. A type error is because you cannot add one to a file. Uh, in this case, we get a name error, so open is not in the environment. We do another test. Let's do lamp. Like, have this array of three elements, and this, this is an integer, right? So, what do we get? A name error, five, meaning len is actually in the environment, or we get detected. In this case, uh, we get name error again. So, probably we know that the sandbox is super limited. It's going to be like maybe sinus, maybe cosinus, maybe some other functions, and that's about it. There will be no LAN, no open, no file, no other objects. Uh, let's do another test just to confirm it. We have an array, but we don't use the LAN directly, we just call it the method which is in the back, right? Responsible for it. And what do we get this time? Obviously, we get 5, right? Because the method is still there, which means we can use dot, we can use underscores, and we can use, um, well, brackets of it, obviously, but we can use them. So, let's do some uh, snooping around Python internals, I would say. Because Python is a beautiful language where you can inspect almost anything. Now, on the yellow field is the, this expression shown in the green field evaluated. And in the gray field, uh, it's the same expression, but it's, um, you know, we do a deal of it, so we get all the methods. Uh, well, all the actually fields. In this case, this is well a dictionary, and the dictionary has quite a lot of fields, and it has this class thing, which is super interesting. Let's use class. We get a type dict, and the type has some other stuff, and it has one hidden, which isn't displayed when you do it. It's called base. Now, if you go to base, you actually have base is like a mother class of all classes, which in case of Python is uh, is just object, right? There's something called object. Now, everything in Python is a child of object, every class, right? Which means, if you use another human field called subclasses, then you get, um, oh, this is actually just the field. 
because this is an algorithm that turns the list, and it turns quite a lot of classes. Now, there is one called warnings. Uh, it's, yeah, well, warning, but it was actually quite funny because it shouldn't be verb. Mm. The index of it is 59, it depends on the version of Python on the runtime environment and a couple of other things. So if you actually create, oh, well, this is just the class if you create an instance of it, uh, there's, it has a field called underscore module. When you go there, you have something called built-ins. Now, built-ins is quite a lot of things in Python. It's, uh, well, one of the things which is, which is there is called import. You probably heard about it. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's about import. And yeah, let, let's just finish it, right? So, end of game, we have this expression. We import module called OS. Then we call system. And then we call netcat with a shell spanning bash into our port. And uh, this works beautifully. Yeah, normally you do get a shell. Okay, if you like to read more about Python sandboxing, you can actually go to my blog, there's the slash n thingy. I keep some notes there, and uh, I try to write down all the interesting things I find about Python sandboxes there. Uh, this presentation will be in my blog, by the way, so you don't have to you know, uh, remember the link. Now, a couple of funny stories related. First story, there was a spammer. You know what, what spammers do, they spam. For example, they spam my friend's blog, right? A lot of comments, and he had this captcha. It was a mathematical captcha. So you had to solve the captcha in each time you submitted a comment. Now, how did the spammer solve the captcha? A. He implemented a parser, a conversion from infix notation to reverse Polish notation, and then used a stack machine to calculate the result. B. He used Eva. <laughs> Well, the answer is that actually using this CAPTCHA solved the problem. <laughs> I, I asked the chewing to my friend. He'll be happy about it. Now, uh, there is, sometimes it goes the other way around. Sometimes there are algorithmical challenges on capture the flag tournaments. And my friend was solving one, and he like jumps to IRC and says like, so I solved several hundred of levels, and suddenly I get this. And he was also doing math equations, but thankfully he knows this, so he had a regular expression before the eval he used, just to guard against this stuff. So, yeah, I wonder how many teams just like got all the scripts whacked just because they didn't put the right exploit to it. Okay, and I think this is the last thing I have. Um, nightmares. Another sandbox. Same story as before. We have a formula, we can execute any code. And uh, the problem is, only one thing in the environment called std out. They removed all other objects, everything. The warnings class I used, they removed it, everything. This is only std out. Now, what can you do with std out? Let's begin with just having this. And well, class wasn't removed, it has to be there, right? Now, what's the class of std out? Yeah, file, file, exactly. So, this is type file, and having the type, you can create a new instance of the class, right? So, you just open prox self man, which is Python memory. So, you get direct access to Python's binary memory. How does it help? Now, since you can use seek and read, and you can use also write, you can find the address of the system function in the GOT. GOT is uh, the import table, so each executable image in memory has an import table, and it's filled while, when loading with addresses of functions, right? And uh, Python uses system, so its address has to be there. You take it, and you write this, the same address under the fopens, um, entry inside the same import table. Which means that if we try to open another file, it will actually execute a command. And it worked beautifully. Instead this time of like opening cut, asterisk to just run the command because the system in the end was involved. 
So summary, uh, from my perspective as an offensive researcher and CTF player, Python is, is epic for a lot of challenges and a lot of uses. Um, there are a lot of cool libraries for it, the built-in library for HTTP is, is super, especially when you're, when you're exploiting stuff like line SQL and it gets funny. Um, it has a lot of instrumentations for random stuff. For example, there's one created by Eero Carrera, I believe, for Box. Box is actually a full-blown x86 emulator. It even supports emulating hypervisors, it can run Windows 8. It's pretty awesome that you can instrument it uh, in Python. And uh, it's also a fun target to look into if you're into hacking low levels of a language like Scratch Now, this presentation actually contains snippets from my other presentations, being data, 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 uh, on the battlefield to the dragons, which I did with Euro, with Mateusz Jurczyk. Uh, then there was a Polish one attacking a system with city computer over, and uh, pawning sometime with style dragons, and also CTFs, with, also with Mateusz. Uh, you can look them up where the slides for them are uh, online. And some of the things I shown, I kind of simplified them because they have other steps. So if you're into stuff like this, just look them up. Uh, that's it. I'm happy to answer all easy questions. If there are hard questions, I would say that we are out of time. Thank you. Okay, do we have time? Yes, we have we have about ten minutes. Okay, sorry for finishing early. Okay, so a quick, quick question about uh, debugger APIs. Did you try any other debuggers like Rodari, Capstone Engine, and stuff like that? I uh, never no, noticed any. I didn't. I only tried the three I mentioned, uh, which was GDB, WinBag, and well, I have or I didn't actually touch the debugger part of it. Okay, thanks. Did you try them? Would you recommend them? Uh, just play a little. Okay. Are, are we better written? Uh, I don't know. I didn't get to the level when I have to automate all this stuff. Okay. Okay. How can I get your book? Uh, you can pre-order it on my publisher's website. And uh, I would recommend doing it because my publisher says that they have problems with Printing the right amount, and there will be some delays. So the faster you order, actually, the better chance we'll get it without the delay. So we brought that. My publisher is, by the way, called Pearl, uh, actually PWN, so, which stands for Paul Skibler, Mr. Long Color. You can find it using Google, I guess. Are there any other questions? It's not uh, directly related to your laptop, but why are you uh, using Windows? Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I would, uh, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't be uh, surprised if you are uh, using the Linux or Mac OS, but uh, why Windows? Okay, so it's like this. I actually use both Windows and Linux. I have a Linux virtual machine always running in the background and a set of scripts, surprise written in Python, to better communicate between them. So I try to use best of both worlds. Now, I guess your question is related to security, right? Why use Windows? Now, actually, problems with Windows security, in all honesty, are outdated. I mean, 10, ten years ago, uh, I would say, like, yeah, yeah, I shouldn't be using Windows. Now, Windows is not the problem. You know what's the problem? OS X. I wouldn't recommend using that. So I, I think Windows is okay-ish. The problem is that it's a huge target, right? So, like, everyone is writing exploits for Windows. That doesn't mean that OS X is secure. That means that people are starting to look at it and starting to care, especially since it came to x86 platform. But, yeah. So, Windows is better, especially when you go to the Windows 8, which I didn't like the UI, but Windows 10 is a little better. They internally had so many changes that it makes Exploiting harder, a lot, a lot harder. So it's pretty secure, I'd say. Uh, actually, uh, I, I Okay, so the argument is that the, the question was about actually using 
Linux and Windows for security purposes. As I said, I try to use both worlds, so I have actually a Jnotter now running here because I have X servers running on my Windows. So it, it interests QL. I agree that Windows shell is lacking. I do use a different one rather than the standard one is called uh, Conemo. And uh, it's, it's uh, based on the Pathy engine. It's way better than the default Windows one. But being said, when it comes to tools, well, some awesome stuff is mostly on Linux, which is why I have a VM always running in the background. Some stuff is only available or works better on Windows. For example, IDA for a long time, which is like the, the only disassembler people use, was most of the time only available for Windows, right? And uh, also, when we, I, I'm interested in reverse engineering, and when it comes to reverse engineering, uh, on Windows, people did a lot of super awesome stuff related to that. Like the level of reverse engineering applications on Windows is this, on Linux is this. Why? Well, because Linux is open source. What would you reverse, right? <laughs> yeah, so um, if you're into reversing, you probably say that Linux is boring at some point and just go to Windows because people care about DRMs and stuff like that more, or so you have more challenges. Okay, the question, uh, probably the answer is fine and bold, but uh, how should I start if I'd like to join Dragon sector in a couple of next years? Okay, so it's a good question. Actually, what I would recommend is just start uh, doing war games. So, war, it's like this, but CTF, a CTF is a tournament, basically, it's like time limited, only two weeks, uh, sometimes the team size is limited. Now, a war game is something which goes continuous, like uh, uh, spoilers for algorithmic challenges. Um, so, try to do some more games. There is this site called wechow.net, and there is a, it's basically an aggregate of all the war games. There are a couple of awesome ones. You can do them, you know, in spare time, and after you do some of them, you can try your, um, your skills with uh, Capture the Flag. Just either join a team, play with some friends, or some open teams as well, which you don't have to join, you just play with them. Um, yeah, if you like it, if you feel that you have a specific amount of time that you can use on for it, then yeah, give, me a, give me an email, send me an email. Any other questions? Uh, just one more comment here. If you go to my blog, or actually Google my blog with the term hacking, there's a post with quite a lot of links on how to get started on hacking without breaking any laws. So basically ethical hacking. So, and a lot of war games are listed there as well. Okay, if there are no more questions, then thank you. Thank you very much.